HCAM News is supported by our viewers and by Hopkinton Drug, located in this historic New England town since 1954. They are a multifaceted store dedicated to providing clients with an array of healthcare options. Hello, everyone, and welcome to HCAM News. I'm HCAM News Director Tom Nappy, here to fill you in on what's happening in Hopkinton. On today's edition of HCAM News, we have highlights of week six of the Hiller Spring Sports season. We take a look at some of the candidates in this year's town election, plus a whole lot more. But first, the select board candidates participated in HCAM's annual contested races debates. If elected, what are your top priorities? John, we'll start with you. Well, again, I just, uh, I just said it's, it's uh, trying to uh, make sure that we retain our, our, our world-class people. But again, it's uh, protect our, our world-class schools, uh, make sure that we uh, build the, uh, an, an Elmwood school. Um, but again, protect our award-winning police department, support the, the chief's initiatives to, um, to retain his personnel. You know, maybe uh, um, uh, work with him to create a, um, a training task force. Like this is some, you know, one of the things that was going on before when people were saying there was no rhetoric to get rid of the get rid of our uh, our police and defund them. But silence is acceptance, and and a lot of stuff was happening in this town, and and we've got to got to support uh, our police department. We're number one. We should have it. We should be sending our uh, uh, personnel out there with the, without um, through standard operating procedures and training our regional um, police forces to make them as good as we are. And then protecting the taxpayers. We've got to protect our taxpayers. No overrides. You know, we, we should actually start thinking about doing underrides. We've already got 400000 left on this budget. So we've got to start really looking at things and not uh, just uh, uh, taxation for, uh, for just because. All right, thank you. Uh, Mary Jo, if elected, what are your top priorities? Well, one is I, I want to see the town move forward in every way. Um, we have some smaller items, and, and, and they're not so small. I mean, the uh, accidents that have been happening every week, it seems like, uh, by Cumberland Farms has to be addressed. We're working with a, with um, Mass Dot to do to they're studying the problem now and we're going to do something about it uh i i feel that um all of, all of those things are priorities they have been priorities we and we get some rumors out there that i like to put to bed but um we always have supported our police department if you go back and look at the budgets they have always been funded and uh, they still are being funded um and I, I just think that Hoppington is a great town. The schools are doing well, and I was really happy when we were, when we were challenged with taking $2.5 million out of the budgets, how the schools and the boards and everybody came together and they said, yes, we will open up our budgets. It's one town, one budget, and I think it's one town, one team. All right, thank you. Shahidul, if elected, what are your top priorities? Thank you. I'll focus on three key areas. The first and foremost, we've been talking about it, managing growth. And that is a complicated equation. We want to keep at our eyes on the ball, our prized asset, the schools. We want to make sure our police, DPW, fire, everyone's funded properly, and we maintain the level of services. And we want to do it with a balanced budget and keeping taxes in check. But we need to do it with proper planning, strategic planning, and making sure it ties together. We definitely don't want overrides or more uh, taxes on our burden, but it's not going to happen magically. We have to make it happen. Planning and we need everyone's hands together to cooperate on that. Number two, I want to focus on business. Post downtown corridor, how can we make it more vibrant? How can we attract more business and support post-COVID era business evolution and business growth? And last but not the least, again, focus on collaboration, building and helping with diversity and working as one Hopkinton, one community. Those would be my goals. All 
All right, thank you. The Hopkinton Women's Club hosted their 34th annual Meet the Candidates program. Here's a look at the three-year school committee candidates. Sure. As, yeah. a, as the pandemic pushed children onto screens and electronic devices for education, entertainment, and socialization, we saw an undeniable rise in youth mental health issues. Do you see this as a major concern impacting our schools? And what policies would you implement or avoid in order to help our students? So I thought I was going to have to answer Nancy's question. So <laughs> let me just switch gears for a second. Um, can you read the question one more time, please? Absolutely. Thank you. As the pandemic pushed children onto screens and electronic devices for education, entertainment, and socialization, we saw an undeniable rise in mental health issues. Do you see this as a major concern impacting our schools? And what policies would you implement or avoid in order to help our students? Right. So I think, um, as I said in my um, opening, mental health is a huge issue for, for kids. Um, it was an issue before the pandemic, and it certainly um, is out of control now. Um, I think that um, our kids were pushed onto um, screens as we thought it was necessary at the time to um, get out the education and the learning. Um, but now knowing what we um, know now, I think that it, it would be good to remove the screens um, to a level that our kids are not completely being educated on that. I think um, being physically in the building, physically in front of a teacher, especially for elementary learners, is in, is crucially important. I think a lot of the mental health and the bullying issues that we're seeing at the middle school are a result of kids being pushed into a bedroom for, or two year, um, for two years to a year and are being put on a screen in front of social media, in front of their education, and they weren't able to get that development um, that you typically get um, going to sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Um, those years are huge years of development. So I think, yes, I think they're, they're, um, while screens um, have an important role um, in education, and that's just technology, and there's definitely pros to technology, I think we need to get our kids back into the building and back in front of teachers and, and in front of live instruction. Thank you. Holly Lynn Moran, you've been an outspoken advocate for pandemic policies publicly against a return to school, against a return to full-time school, and more recently, against the ma mask option policy. Mm -hmm. Your reasoning for these positions has been your own personal health status, insisting that you never leave your home because doing so would risk your life. You've now chosen to run for a very public position, one that re will require you to be in places with unmasked people, including town meeting and the high school graduation. Should the public assume that you have changed your position and you now believe that one-way masking will keep you safe? So if you're talking about a timeline of two years, the first year we knew nothing about COVID, nobody had vaccines, it was awful. Every day we'd hear about tons of deaths. Then the second year we had vaccines, but we didn't have any for our children. Um, and at this point, I'm a very data-driven person. I look at the numbers and I say, well, it's safe for most people, and I go outside with an N95 mask because that is what experts in medicine do. And when I was advocating in the past about um, masking vulnerable people, that was it was not for myself. It was for the vulnerable people within the community, and that includes family members of vulnerable people because, as we know, our children can be vectors in the spread of disease, right? So. Science evolves, and I'm a person that, as I said, I'm data-driven, and I spent my whole, like, a career in science. So numbers mean a lot to me, and that's how I make my choices. I use evidence, I use data, and I use my own um, background in research and uh, data analysis. So today, what we're talking about today is not like last year in April or the year before in April. We have layers of therapeutics we have uh, we're almost going to get our kids under five vaccinated we have um boosters for kids from five to eleven like, we have so much more now than we did then it is still dangerous for me but i've been told by my doctor if i wear an n95 in a room that i should be safe so that's what i follow 
I follow science, I follow data, and I would not support universal masking at this time because of the data. We're going to take a quick time out, a whole lot more ahead. Don't go anywhere. HCAM programming is supported by our viewers, thank you, and by Phipps Insurance Agency, representing companies such as MapFree Insurance. Their family-owned independent agency is deeply rooted in the communities they serve and offer time-tested insurance products to fit individual needs. Since 1950, Phipps Insurance specializes in home, auto, business, condo, and renter's insurance. Welcome back to HCAM News. Right now, we take a look at the one-year school committee candidates in this year's Hopkinton Town election. The Hopkinton Women's Club hosted their 34th annual Meet the Candidates Night. In this segment, we hear from school committee candidates for the one-year seat position. Jared, your question is, what letter grade would you assign to the school committee for its performance during the last past year? And why? <laughs> Tough question. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I think as I look back on the past year, uh, look, it was a difficult year for everyone. So I think as I look at that, I'd say as far as the school committee performed, you know, let's call it a C. Uh, some things went well. Um, Hopkinton should be better. You know, we should have been on the leading edge of bringing students back to school. We should have been on the leading edge of removing masks. We should have been on the leading edge in face-to-face -face learning time. And the reality is, you know, we were at the very end. You know, we were the top 10% uh, when students went back to school the first time the state evaluated it. We were in the bottom 10% um, for face-to-face -face time between students and teachers. They evaluated a second time. We didn't go up. We went down. You know, we went down below that bottom 10%. That's disappointing. I think as a town, we should expect more. Uh, as parents, we should expect more. Um, and frankly, I think we need to do better. Thank you. Jen, given <clears throat> that you have served on the school committee before and have decided to run again, can you speak to the high-profile votes of the last two years, including a return to hybrid school, a return to full-time school, and reinstating the mask option? How would you have voted on these issues if you had been on the committee during the last two years? You know, that's, that's a tricky question because we didn't know then what we know now. So I think, you know, that's a little bit loaded. But um, I, I was on the, um, I can't remember what we called ourselves, but the, the reentry committee um, over this course of the summer and the early fall, we had a group of folks who, um, parents, um, teachers, uh, school committee members, and um, we had folks that met and were divided up into sort of subcommittees of this reentry group. And um, folks were tasked with, um, should we go hybrid? How should the hybrid look like? Folks were tasked with um, masking, seating in the classrooms. Folks were tasked with the lunchrooms um, and how that was going to play out. Um, I can't remember the number of people that were on this group, but it was fairly large, 40 to 50 people divided into these subgroups, each working, and then coming back together and making recommendations to the school committee and to the superintendent. And so I, I appreciated the, the very sort of collaborative and sort of open approach that the school committee and the superintendent made to try to get input from the community. I think it's tricky because I think a lot of us were focused on our families and on our own situation at the time. So folks may not have participated for a whole host of reasons. Um, and we were pretty fried from Zoom by then anyway. Um, little did we know we'd have another year of Zoom at that point, or almost a year of Zoom. But I think um, you know it's hard to answer the question <coughs> because I think um, with the information that we had at the time, I, I appreciated that we went maskless in November. We were the first school district, I believe, in the country. It was on NPR. My friend out in Seattle called me, and she's like, is, are you Hopkinton, Massachusetts? And I was like, we are. She's like, you guys are mas unmasking? I'm like, we are. So I think you know, we made the right calls. We tried um, different options to try to see what was the best choice with the information that we had at the time. And I think, I think we did well. 
Um, but of course, in hindsight, you can always find out where you didn't do well and you can look back and try to make sure you don't make those same mistakes next time around if there ever is a next time around, hopefully in 150 years. <laughs> Hopkinton Hillers spring sports teams are fighting hard as we enter the second half of the season. Here's a look at the latest. On Friday, May 6th, Hiller boys lacrosse lost a tough one on the road. 12 to one versus Foxborough. The Hillers fall to three and seven on the season. Also on Friday, May 6th, Hiller boys tennis beat Norton via a shutout. The Hillers are now 8-1 and one on the season. Girls Lacrosse hosted Foxborough and lost a close one, 11-8. The Hiller girls are 3-8 and eight overall on the season. Hiller Softball battled Norton. Hopkinton was trailing 4-1 to one heading into the bottom of the fifth. That'll fill up the count. We're on second, two outs. And this is golfed in the air. That's going to land fair and be bobbled by the pitcher. Everybody's safe. And now DeSamal going to keep going to second. Slides in, safe. Good heads up by DeSamal. Wind up in the pitch. Hit high in the air, right side. And it is going to be dropped. One run is in, here comes another, and now heading over to second, she's gonna be safe. And that was a very tough catch to try to make for Julia LaBelle. And the ball just started tracking inward ferociously. And it's a four to three game. Two RBI hit for Paharic. Ashley Callery to the plate. Ashley Callery at the plate, she's 0 for two so far today. And this is ripped up the middle. Glow oh, bobbled by the shortstop. Throw to first, it's gonna be high, and another run scores! Tie game! Baharic comes around, and it's four to four. Hillers tie the game up at four apiece, and it remained that way until the top of the seventh. And this is crushed over to left field, see ya! That is a two-run blast. Wow, Campbell Smith tattooed that ball. That was an impressive shot, I must say. A two-run homer by Norton's Campbell Smith and the Lancers hang on for the win. Norton improves to seven and three. Hillers fall to six and five. Hiller baseball and Norton battled under the lights Friday night, May 6th. It was a scoreless game heading into the bottom of the third. Vieira takes a peek at second and delivers. And this is on the ground, up the middle, that's going to get through. Hallenbeck being waved around, here he comes. And it's going to be a one nothing Hiller lead. An RBI single for Dylan Locke. Wind up in the pitch. And this is hit in the air, that'll drop into left field. Paharic around to score. Here comes Andrew Gunn around to score. The throw's cut off and it's three to nothing Hillers. A two RBI single for Joe Scardino. Good piece of hitting there. Hiller's plate three, but Norton responded in the top of the fourth. Ball. He's going to play at 4 p.m. as well, and girls across at 4.30. This is hit up the middle. That'll get through, and here comes a Norton run. RBI single for Connor Lynch. It's a three to one game. He's had a work a bit here in the fourth. That is high, going to get away. The runner coming home to score the tag. And he is going to be safe. A three to two game heading into the bottom of the fifth. Three nothing game at the time as this is up the left side. That's gonna get through. Hallenbeck is around to score. Here comes Dylan Locke around to score. And it's a two RBI base hit by Joe Scardino, he does it again, his second two RBI hit of the game. 
A 5-2 Hiller lead heading into the bottom of the sixth. Set to deliver. And this is hit in the air over to left field. It is gonna be off the left fielder's glove and drop. Here comes Carrazzo around to score. Petroni gonna keep heading to third and the throw in is not in time. An RBI triple by Charlie Petroni. And he gets a piece of this one up the left side and that'll get into left field. Another run around to score. An RBI single for Dylan Locke. Norton down to their final three outs, trailing seven to two in the top of the seventh. There's a strike, out number one. Line up and the pitch. Swing and a miss. And there is out number two. Lancers down to their final out. And I think he went. And he did indeed. Nick Paharic strikes out the side as the Hillers take the 7-2 win. Hillers improve to 7-5 and five on the season. Mike Bernie gets the win. Nick Paharic gets the save. On Monday, May 10th, Hiller Girls Tennis captured a shutout win over Millis. The Hillers improve to 9-1 and one with the win. Millis falls to 4-3. and three. Hiller Softball also picked up a road win Monday over Millis, 8-3. Charlotte Can pitched a complete game and had 13 strikeouts. Caroline D. Simone went 3-4 for four at the plate. Hiller Unified Track and Field had a great day at the sectionals. John Murray took first in the 100-meter and the long jump. The relay team also set a school record. Now time for some happenings in town you should know about. The HMS Drama Club presents Frozen Junior on Friday, May 20th at 7 p.m. and also on Saturday the 21st at 7 p.m. You can see all the information at our website, hcam.tv. Tickets are $15 for adults and $10 for students. Seniors are free. Own one of these terrific Hopkinton Hillers flags and show your support for your team. And you'll be supporting the class of 2022. For details, head over to hopsenior2022.com. Our photo of the week is courtesy of John Ritz. A beautiful waterfall at the ruins of Woods Factory on Whitehall Brook in Woodville. What a terrific photo. Important government dates to keep in mind on Monday, May 16th at 8 p.m. Be sure to tune in live for the town election results. And don't forget to vote on Monday, May 16th. Polls open at 7 a.m. at Hopkinton Middle School. On Tuesday, May 17th at 6 p.m., you can catch the select board meeting live on HCAM TV. We'll also have the planning board meeting live on our YouTube page. To view all upcoming town government meetings, head over to hcam.tv slash gov. And for all town government meeting information, you can head over to hopkintonma.gov. Believe it or not, we are out of time for this edition of HCAM News. But don't worry, next Thursday at 6.30 p.m., we'll be back. As always, we thank you for tuning in. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll talk to you again soon. The Hopkinton Annual Town Meeting took place Monday, Tuesday, and into Wednesday. On night one, after the first 21 articles passed, Article 22, MWRA Connection Design Work, sponsored by the DPW, raised a good amount of debate. The moderator. 
Uh, this article seeks $1.3 million for the design of an indirect connection to the MWA water supply. Sorry. Uh, this article requests $1.3 million for the design of an indirect connection to the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, or MWRA, water supply through the town of Southboro. What this is uh, intended to design is two 12-inch pipes for redundancy from Southboro to a new pump station, and that new pump station will be located at Cedar Street and Legacy Farms Road North. From there, there'll be one 12-inch pipe running along Cedar Street and connecting to the existing pipe near C Street, and one 12-inch pipe running along Legacy Farms Road North and connecting to the existing pipe on Wilson Street. The change in water supply is hoped to decrease the amount of toxicity, such as PFAS, in the water supply. This will provide a sustainable, safe, and reliable water supply to meet the town's essential needs. The water quality will meet all DEP and public health standards. It will eliminate PFAS, iron, and manganese contamination from our existing sources. It will be resilient to climate change and droughts, and it will redirect town resources to conservation and management measures. So I understand exactly what you're saying because I was referring to private wells, not referring to the wells on Fruit Street or anywhere else. You're saying that... I'm terribly sorry. So the funding mechanism... Yeah, I meant household wells, but I, clearly I was misunderstood. Um, what is the expected impact on private well owners vis-a-vis uh, -vis the town funding? Through the moderator, uh, the, at this point, uh, we don't know what the distribution will be for the cost of construction. Again, several unknowns how many uh, what we have for ARPA funds availability um, but the the anticipated cost sharing will be between both water customers and across the general fund the vote on article 22 concluded early in tonight two and passed the clear majority to conclude night two article 45 which was a citizen's petition for a land acquisition of 0 and 71 Franklin Road was heavily debated. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, we already checking. have home sales on Fawn Ridge Road. Um, the neighborhood is extremely upset to have that forest clear cut. There's nothing like it in that neighborhood. Um, so we are suggesting that the town take it by eminent domain. This has been done before in Newton and on Nahant and preserve it with the rest of the deer run.